Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Market to Every Guest Personality. But first, a little about me. My name is Gavin Wadsworth, and I am a hospitality researcher and content writer at ResNexus with a degree in digital cinema. And I'm very excited about today's topic of how to broaden your marketing scope using personality types. One interesting thing that not a lot of people know about me is that I worked on this commercial fishing boat in Alaska when I was a teen. That meant that I was on this exact boat for months at a time with not a lot to do except to admire the beauty of Alaska. I love Alaska and I'd love an excuse to go visit again. It's definitely kindled a desire in me to visit new places and see the world and do lots more traveling. So to get started, uh, I want to talk briefly about marketing, and it's important to keep your objective in mind, and that'll kind of inform this presentation going forward. The objective is, of course, to reach and engage your audience. You want to retain your existing customers and attract new customers. It's been said that the hospitality industry is really the people industry. Customer satisfaction is the goal in every industry, but hospitality is uniquely guest-oriented. The messages you convey to your audience aren't just an invitation to book with you. They're a promise of what they can expect during their stay. Marketing means predicting and delivering on your guests' needs. So that goal is pretty clear, reach and engage your audience, but the bigger question is who are you marketing to? Odds are you're marketing towards what you would appreciate as an audience yourself. For example, maybe when you're looking at travel options for yourself, you respond best to marketing that emphasizes relaxation and memorable experiences. So it makes sense to emphasize those things in your own marketing, because that's what you would look for. But to someone who responds better to information about local restaurants, number of online reviews, and check-in and check-out times, that might not be as appealing. So what's the point of this example? Your audience could be bigger. If you expand your marketing, to appeal to a wider variety of consumers, and if you hone in on what kinds of people your business tends to attract, you stand to increase your bookings and revenue. With our objective in mind, let's look ahead at what we'll go over today. First, we'll explore the different personality types you might encounter. Then we'll go over the classic modes of persuasion and how you can appeal to different people. Then we'll bring everything together and go over specific examples of how to market using these concepts. And finally, we'll have some time at the end for a Q&A. With that in mind, let's get started. And first, I'd like to show you a couple of videos. So, I'm a beachside hotel. Uh, as you can see, I'm pretty relaxed. Uh, I don't mean to brag, but I do have multiple pools. I'm looking for someone who likes sand and sun. Uh, active types are cool. I know a lot of fun spots. Uh, if you have kids, great. I'm great with kids. And uh, yeah, that's me, uh, Beachside Hotel. Okay, so this commercial is catering to a specific kind of traveler. The gimmick is that it feels like a dating profile, and everything in this video emphasizes relaxation, fun experiences, and togetherness. Hotels.com wants you to feel a certain way after you watch their commercial. They're appealing to your positive emotions. Now let's watch the next video. I am a business hotel. I eat, sleep, and breathe efficiency. I expect my bed sheets to be as crisp as my spreadsheets. I'm looking for someone who appreciates high ROIs and even higher RPMs. Must like hard work, punctuality, and a good firm handshake. If you're someone who likes earning rewards as much as earnings reports, I would be honored to be your perfect somewhere. So, the same company, different marketing tactic. Here, Hotels.com is trying to appeal to a wider variety of audiences. This commercial has a very different tone from the Beach Hotel one. This one's message is all about efficiency and business. We've still got the same dating profile gimmick as the first one, but this one feels a bit more benefit-driven rather than emotion-driven. Because when you're staying at a hotel for business, 
You want efficiency and reliability. You want somewhere you can work, have business meetings, and maintain your workout routine. Notice also, this commercial mentioned earning rewards. That goes back to efficiency again. The message here is, when you book with Hotels.com, you're saving money for future bookings. If Hotels.com had only put out one of these two commercials, they would be appealing to a smaller audience. Now, obviously, these two different hotels have different target audiences themselves. If the Beach Hotel tried to appeal to business travelers, they might have a harder time of it. But if they have a strong internet connection, they might be able to target workation people who want to work remotely in a luxurious location. And conversely, the business hotel might be able to entice leisure travelers by emphasizing nearby attractions and showing families playing in the pool. The point is, not everyone responds to the same marketing efforts the same way. Everyone has their own priorities, mindsets, and personalities, which brings us back to the topic of today's webinar. By understanding how different people think and function, you can better apply your marketing to hone in on the kinds of people your property tends to attract and expand your efforts to target more customers. So you have probably seen or taken a personality type quiz at some point in your life. There are more personality type structures out there than you can shake a stick at. Uh, they're very popular and it's a really fun idea. Uh, ostensibly, you can use your results to learn more about yourself, which can help you in your career and relationships. The reality is that a lot of these tests promise more than they actually deliver, and they don't. They, they kind of use pseudoscience to back up their claims. Um, even really popular and broadly accepted ones, like the Myers Briggs, uh, they don't really have very much in the way of actual data behind them. It's, so it's dubious whether you can use these personality quizzes to determine like a potential employee's hireability or whether two people can have a successful relationship together, but that doesn't mean they aren't useful in other ways. Everyone is a unique blend of their own personality traits, so any kind of categorization won't ever be fully correct. They're just quizzes, not prophecies. But understanding a couple of broad personality types can help you widen your reach in your marketing because different people respond differently to various tactics. So none of these personality type systems is perfect, but the majority of them agree on the broad strokes. So we'll just go with the broad stroke system for simplicity. This is a slightly reworked version of the Merrill Wilson breakdown. This breakdown has four categories, and no one's gonna be 100% of one and 0% of the others. The idea here is that any one person is going to be a combination of several, but the four categories here are driven, analytical, expressive, and amiable. One important thing to keep in mind is that none of these personality types are better or worse than any other. Everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses, and none of these is better in any way. I like that these styles are adjectives, not nouns, because attaching labels to people like, oh, he's a Capricorn, or she's a C-type personality, or he's an INTP, I think that kind of gives the wrong impression. These aren't boxes that everyone fits into neatly. I might have analytical or expressive tendencies, but that doesn't define me by itself. So when I'm talking about these styles, I'm not actually describing anyone in particular. These are personality traits that people might reflect to any extent, large or small. Another good way to think about this is that most people have a default mode that reflects one of these styles, but that doesn't define how they'll act in every situation. All right, that out of the way, let's start going over these different styles. The driven personality style has to do with a desire to get things done. Driven people tend to be destination people, not journey people. They respond to clear, concise communication. This is someone who tends to take a leadership position when everyone else is waffling. Driven people are also known as the fact-based extrovert. In other words, they are concerned with information and getting things done, but they also feel at home in groups of people. You might recognize someone as having driven qualities if they seem stubborn, action-oriented, impatient, and proactive. If you know someone that isn't afraid to speak their mind, that's another good indicator. This might make it seem like the driven personality style is domineering, but that isn't necessarily the case. They just want to move forward and get things done. 
they don't like spending an hour deciding where to eat or what movie to see. Driven people like to be direct. Small talk or talking around a subject might frustrate them. They prefer to get straight to the point, learn all they need to know, and move on. They might come off as impatient or annoyed, but it's just because they prefer to resolve things in the most efficient way. When you're talking to someone who seems to exhibit these qualities, you might impress them by being as direct as they are. First, listen carefully to make sure you fully understand what they're saying. People with this personality style tend to get annoyed when they have to repeat themselves. So listen closely and figure out what they're trying to say or ask. If you don't fully understand, ask clarifying questions, then be direct in your responses. For example, if a driven person asks you about a good place to eat nearby, you don't want to spend too much time waffling. If they're responded with, I don't know, what are you in the mood for? Uh, they may feel frustrated because they haven't yet been given any information. To a driven person, a direct response is much more helpful. So if you said instead, there's a sushi place down the street and a fine dining Italian restaurant in the other direction. If you're willing to drive, there's a really good teriyaki place downtown. That is sure to grab their attention, concrete information they can use. All right, we're on to the second style. The analytical style is also fact-based, but more introverted. Unlike the driven style, the analytical might be slower to make decisions, preferring to carefully weigh all the options first. Where the driven person might have asked you directly where to find a good place to eat, an analytical person is more likely to do their own research. They'll probably check Google Maps to see nearby restaurants, factoring in each restaurant's review scores, number of reviews, location, pricing, and menu options, and then make their own decision based on all of those things put together. Analytical people don't just want to make quick decisions, they want to make the right decisions using all of the available information. You can usually identify an analytical person by the way they enjoy explaining things that interest them, or when they take a detail-oriented approach to problems. Analyticals can sometimes come off as perfectionist or overly critical, because they like to examine all aspects of a topic. When they're approached by an employee in a store, they're less likely to ask for anything, preferring to shop around on their own without the pressure of getting someone else involved. They prefer to do things their own way and at their own pace. Analytical people usually prefer a quiet, undistracted environment. They tend to feel uncomfortable when faced with large displays of emotion, whether positive or negative. They like to be asked questions for which they know the answers. And when asking questions, they prefer to be answered clearly and exactly. So when you're communicating with an analytical person, try not to be pushy or hurried. Like the driven style, the analytical style prefers direct statements, but it's okay to slow it down and add more details. Also, try to eliminate distractions. Analytical people are typically more introverted, and too much sensory overload can kind of stress them out. So turn down the radio, give them your full attention, and don't try to do too much at once. Okay, now we're on to the third of the four styles. The expressive personality style is extroverted and relationship-based. So they have the interpersonal confidence of the driven style, but they're less interested in hard facts and information. The expressive is more keyed into feelings and big ideas. Expressive people tend to have big personalities. They don't mind talking to strangers and being in crowds, and they enjoy being the center of attention. They might know lots of people and have lots of friends, and they're very good at remembering personal details about others. If you're surprised when someone remembers to ask about one of your family members they've never even met, there's a good chance they have a strong expressive streak. Out of all these four personality styles, the expressive is probably the easiest to spot, and you're probably already thinking about some of the expressive people in your life. They're usually the first to notice when someone is feeling sad or upset. So expressive people respond very well to social interaction in general. Connecting with other people energizes and excites them, and they tend to react favorably when others can match their own energy. Since expressive people are all about socialization, 
they think more in terms of relationships than precise facts. So, so if an expressive person asks you for restaurant recommendations, if you say something like, oh, my wife and I, we go to this great Italian place down the street, great food, great atmosphere, oh, and uh, I'm friends with one of the cooks there, that's likely to grab their attention. In other words, emphasize people, relationships, and feelings. They don't necessarily want to know all the details, but they want to know what it feels like to eat there. Finally, expressive people really appreciate it when you show an interest in their personal lives. Asking questions about their family, career, friends, and schooling gives them an opportunity to talk about themselves. That doesn't mean they're self-absorbed, it's just that they like to express themselves, and they like it when others do the same. All right, so the last of these four basic personality styles is the amiable style, which is also called the relationship-based introvert. Amiable people often come off as shy but sincere. They don't usually like being the center of attention. They don't like to be decision makers in groups, uh, but they are concerned with making sure that everyone is getting along and content. Some traits that might indicate an amiable personality style are things like being soft-spoken, a follower rather than a leader, and a people pleaser. Amiable people tend to crave stability, peace, and harmony. Conflict of any kind tends to make them uncomfortable. A person who is very amiable is unlikely to complain even if something isn't right. For example, if they're eating at a restaurant and their order is mixed up, they probably won't mention anything to the waiter. With that in mind, that should inform you how you communicate with an amiable person. Just like all the other personality styles, a big component of communication is mirroring the way they act. If they're soft-spoken, you're soft-spoken too. Statements of affirmation are also helpful. Because amiable people tend to be shy and soft-spoken, they can sometimes have a hard time being heard. So demonstrating to them that you hear them might seem like a small thing, but it actually goes a long way. And finally, providing an amiable person with one or two good suggestions will help them make decisions, and they'll be likely to take your advice. You gotta be careful with this, though. Because amiable people have a hard time saying no, you might not even realize when they're uncomfortable. Okay, so quick review. Here's a representation of these four personality styles on a grid. You can see that each style can be represented as a mixture of two basic traits, extroverted versus introverted, and fact-based versus relationship-based. This is a great way to remember the basics of each style. And now that we've got a good grasp of these different styles and how they work, let's move on to the different ways you can appeal to them. Okay. This might seem like a lot, but I promise it'll all come together. So the modes of persuasion are something that are taught in most schools. They stem from ancient Greek philosophy, and they're still used today. Essentially, these categorize different methods you can use to persuade someone of something. In our case, we of course want to persuade people to stay at our property. So the main three modes of persuasion are ethos, logos, and pathos. Authority, logic, and emotion. And there's also a fourth one that's sometimes included called kairos, or timeliness. You can use these modes of persuasion to learn how to improve your marketing, especially when you combine them with the personality styles we talked about. So let's quickly go over uh, the first mode, ethos. Ethos is the appeal to authority. When you try and persuade someone using ethos, you cite a relevant authority figure, which could be yourself. Basically, you're saying, my claim is true because someone who knows what they're talking about said so. That doesn't necessarily mean the claim is true or false, um, and of course that same thing goes for every mode of persuasion. But let's show some quick examples. 9 out of 10 dentists recommend this toothpaste brand. In this case, the authority you're appealing to is a sample group of dentists. By mentioning that the majority of dentists recommend your brand, you're saying that your toothpaste brand is good. As a father of four, I know that kids struggle with homework. In this case, you're appealing to the audience based on your own authority as a father of four. The audience might be more inclined to believe this claim because the speaker has first-hand experience with kids and homework. The president has issued a statement regarding the recent crisis. The authority here is, of course, the president. 
we wouldn't be as intrigued with Bob from down the street has issued a statement regarding the recent crisis. Uh, now let's take a look at how someone in the hospitality business might use Ethos to appeal to their customers. Our property has over 300 five-star ratings on TripAdvisor. In this case, the authority you're appealing to are the reviewers on TripAdvisor and TripAdvisor itself. Are you going to tell me that over 300 people are wrong? We've been in the hospitality business for over 20 years. And of course, there's a silent, so I know what I'm doing at the end of that one. By mentioning your own history and experience, you imply that you run an excellent business. Our property was featured on USA Today's top 20 B&Bs. Again, this is appealing to another organization's authority. If USA Today is a credible source for information about B&Bs, then this is an impressive statement. Since the driven personality style is both fact-based and extroverted, they might be particularly affected by ethos persuasive methods. If they want to make decisions quickly, then mentioning your property's awards, accolades, and online reviews might help them make that decision in your favor. All right, persuasive mode number two, logos, which is of course the appeal to logic. By using facts, statistics, and truths, you hope to convince someone of your point. All right, here's some examples. Studies have shown that 70% of adults prefer our brands to competitors. And the question I always ask in my head is, which studies, and how were the studies conducted? But it looks really snazzy on a billboard, so it gets the job done. We offer more ice cream flavors than anyone in town. This one I'd probably believe right off the bat, since it'd be pretty easy to verify. If I was going out with a bunch of people for ice cream, I'd probably remember this ad, since it seems to have the most options. Watch movies in 4K IMAX, a 7.1 surround sound at our theater. One thing you might have noticed about these modes of persuasion is that these examples don't necessarily fit perfectly in one category. For example, this one might be appealing to emotion as well, the emotion of having a great time and the best theater experience around. But it's also logos, because they're calling out specific traits about the theater that might set it above the others. All right, now for the industry examples. Our property is located a short walk from over a dozen restaurants, including fine dining and cafes. So Logos appeals often call out a specific benefit rather than big picture things. The benefit here is that you have lots of excellent dining options within a short distance. By using our rewards program, you can save on booking and your points never expire. Again, very benefit driven. You can save money and you don't have to worry about your reward points going away. That's a clear advantage of choosing this property, so you should choose us. Every room is furnished with a remote workstation and reliable ethernet and Wi-Fi connectivity, so you can work interruption free. So again, a clear benefit, and this one's appealing to a specific kind of guest, the one that goes out on workations to work remotely in places more interesting than their house. So this should come as no surprise. The analytical personality style is concerned with facts, logic, and information. They want to make a decision based on the most complete information available. This is where you want to lay out all of your amenities for online booking and list out all the benefits of staying at your property. Analytical people will want to know as much as possible so they can make educated decisions. All right, and the third mode of persuasion is pathos, the appeal to emotion. This one's huge, and you see it all the time. In essence, this mode of persuasion tries to get the audience to feel a certain way. The emotion could be pretty much anything. Curiosity, anger, sadness, excitement. Once you've got the audience feeling the way you want them to, they're more willing to act on what you have to say. Example time. You won't believe what this celebrity said at the awards ceremony. So you've seen ads like this all the time on the internet. This is clickbait. They're only giving us enough information to make us curious, so we click and find out what the celebrity said. But if they just told us what the celebrity said in the ad, we wouldn't have to click to find out. So obviously the emotion they're trying to elicit here is curiosity. Nationwide, shelter animals are suffering. You can help. 
So this pathos is trying to elicit sympathy. It probably goes along with a picture of a sad looking or injured puppy to really tug at your heartstrings. This politician is trying to ruin homeownership for everyone. Obviously, this would go along with the name of whatever politician they're trying to attack. The emotion they're trying to get out of people here is anger. But now it's time for the industry examples again. Make the most of your summer with the people you love. The emotion here is connection and a sense of togetherness. You're trying to get people to remember how fun it is to be with friends and family, and what better time than the summer at our property? If you book in the next three days, 50% of the proceeds will go towards Alzheimer's research. This one's sympathy again. This allows the customer to book a stay and feel like they're helping others at the same time. Some people feel guilty when they buy or do things for themselves. Offers like these might be very convincing to them. Need a break from your routine? Take a breath of fresh air in the outdoors. Relaxation is the main emotion at play here. For people who are stressed about their day-to-day -day job and responsibilities, taking a quiet camping trip might sound like just the thing. Since Pathos is all about evoking emotions in people, the expressive personality style is an excellent fit. When you're marketing toward expressive people, try emphasizing the way they'll feel when they stay at your property. Try to evoke those positive emotions. Show pictures of people having a good time. You could also try quoting one or two of your best reviews with people talking about those things. Since expressive people are relationship-based, then showing concrete examples of other people who had a good experience will help them react more favorably. Last one. Kairos isn't one of the traditional three modes of persuasion, but is sometimes included as a fourth mode. It makes an appeal to timeliness, or knowing exactly when is the most opportune moment to make your argument. For example, making a suggestion in the summer that people should invest in snow shovels is probably not going to be as effective as the same suggestion in the winter. Our spring sale only lasts three more days. Act now. With Kairos, you're looking to encourage someone to do something either based on a ticking clock or because of something that happened recently. In this case, it's the ticking clock. The spring sale won't last much longer, and won't you be disappointed if you don't buy something now? Voting season is here. Are you registered? This one is probably very effective, because it feels more like a reminder than anything else. Also, it's not asking you to vote in any particular way, so it's more universal. Super Bowl Sunday is just around the corner. What's your wing situation? This advertisement is trying to get people to buy chicken wings, specifically for their Super Bowl parties, and uses that as an angle to get more people interested. Alright, industry examples. Need a place to stay during MovieCon? We have availability, but it's going fast. A major part of Kairos is using existing circumstances to take advantage of demand. It's a new year. Start off on the right foot with a yoga and wellness retreat. People tend to make New Year's resolutions about personal wellness, so this appeal is pretty timely, using that to try and influence people who do that kind of thing. Big snowstorm rolled in last night. Claim your spot at our ski resort before it's gone. Again, this is taking advantage of circumstances. In this case, the snowstorm means great snowboarding and skiing. So the amiable personality style tends to respond to limited quantity or timely deals because it helps them feel like they're choosing a good time to act. This style is associated with having a hard time making decisions. So you can make the decision-making process easier by emphasizing limited availability or that there's been no better time to book than now. They might be more willing to take the plunge. All right, the time has come to apply these concepts in our marketing efforts. Let's see how we can actually use this information to our advantage. I've put together some marketing emails to showcase how you can do this. For this first example, take a look at the pictures and the headlines. What's being emphasized? I'll give you just a couple seconds to take a look at it. So this one's really emphasizing family, togetherness, and memorable experiences. 
there are little bits of useful information about the campground sprinkled here and there, but it's mostly to help deliver the feeling of staying at this campground. So pathos is the primary persuasive mode being used, and by extension, that means that expressive people are likely to be the most affected audience for this email. That doesn't mean that this email can't persuade anyone else, but this is definitely more appealing to an expressive person than, say, an analytical person. An analytical person might look at this and feel like someone's trying to manipulate them. All right, here's another email. What's the main message here? It says, our annual spring into summer sale ends soon. For a limited time only, 25% off the base room rate. This email is appealing to your sense of timeliness, Kairos. You have to act now or you'll miss out. There's never been a better time than now. This is a prime example of Kairos in action. And this sense of urgency has a good chance of catching the attention of amiable people who respond to this kind of encouragement. All right, here's the third one. Luxury yurt glamping is one of Hospitality USA's top 10 unique stays. There's a reason we have over 200 five-star reviews on TripAdvisor. See for yourself. This email exudes confidence and has the accolades to back it up. This is clearly an appeal to authority or ethos. Notice that this email doesn't actually list a whole lot of specific benefits. We have unique stay, we have exquisite comfort, the outdoors, and the pictures speak for themselves. But other than that, we're relying on the appeals to other organizations and reviews to trust that this is a good place to stay. And of course, the personality style that responds best to confidence in direct statements is the driven style. All right, so by process of elimination alone, you should probably already have a good idea of what technique is being used in this one. Point break lodging. Working remote doesn't mean you have to work from home. Point break lodging has the connectivity you need, but with more benefits, and then it's got a bullet point list. The dead giveaway here is all the specific information provided in the email. This piece of marketing is relying on logos to persuade people that this property is worth staying at. So of course the associated personality style is analytical. A bullet point list of benefits might not be very persuasive to everyone, but analytical people prefer concrete information to wishy-washy sentiments. That doesn't mean you can't have clever or gimmicky taglines, as evidenced here. That might be enough to get anyone's attention, regardless of their primary personality style. But the analytical person will want to see exactly what they can expect when they stay at this property. So one important thing to note is that you don't have to choose just one mode of persuasion and focus exclusively on that. As part of an ongoing email campaign, you might first send out a pathos email, then a logos email a few weeks later. When you have something to brag about, you might send out an ethos email, or you might use multiple modes in the same email. Another important thing to consider is what kinds of guests you tend to attract at your property, as it might inform your marketing strategy. For instance, if you have something like that beachside resort in the commercial earlier, maybe you're mostly appealing to people's emotions and sense of togetherness. Or if you have a lot of business people coming to stay at your property, maybe you appeal more to their ethos or logos. Identifying a primary and maybe a secondary personality style to focus on might be a good approach to take. Unfortunately, this isn't something you can easily measure methodically. There are just so many factors at work, and trying to quantify which persuasive modes work better than others could end up being a lot of guesswork. You could certainly take a look at your year-over-year -year reports where you try different marketing methods during the same date ranges and see if that has any effect on your bookings. At the end of the day, though, using multiple appeals at the same time can be an effective way to broaden your reach. Let's look at some existing property websites as examples. All right, Big Rock Candy Mountain. Sweet adventure awaits, Utah's premier outdoor adventure destination. So, so far that seems pretty pathos. That seems like it's appealing to your emotions, your desire for adventure and out the outdoors. About Big Rock Candy Mountain. Since 1928, visitors from all over the country and world have made Big Rock Candy Mountain Resort their premier vacation stop. So that sounds kind of ethos. It's saying they've 
been in operation since 1928. They've had visitors from all over the country and world, and it's their premier vacation stop. That's kind of an appeal to authority. This relaxed western resort boasts over 2,000 miles of ATV, UTV, Paiute trail access, river rafting and floats, bike trails, hiking, zip lining, camping, RVing, and much more. So that sounds pretty logos. They're listing a lot of specific benefits and things you can do with the property. With so many fun adventures to choose from, it's no wonder that guests return year after year to experience magic and memories of Big Rock Candy Mountain. And now we're back to pathos again. We're back to appealing to emotions, to experience the magic and memories. So in this one section alone, we're seeing three modes of persuasion in use at the same time. And here we have some great pictures of their property. Book and adventure. Strong words like adventure uh, are, are very pathos driven. And this kind of looks like a bullet point list of specific benefits. An analytical person might be more likely to scroll all the way down on a website to get to this kind of information. Because anyone can say book an adventure, but an analytical person wants to know what specifically can you offer me. So this is very useful. Having something like this really helps out those analytical people. And again, here's a list of amenities. Again, this is helpful helpful for people who have a more analytical bent. All right, what are guests are saying? So whenever you cite your guests talking about your property, that's kind of ethos in and of itself. You're appealing to the authority of people who've stayed at your property before, and you're showcasing what they had to say to show that you have a good property. But each review might have its own specific mode of persuasion. This one says cutest caboose rooms. That's more pathos. Such a fun family getaway. Staff was amazing. Become a new tradition for us. So yeah, that seems pretty pathos as well. Uh, a thousand miles of off-road trails. This seems kind of logos because they have they're listing specific benefits. All right. So that was one example. Let's look at another website. All right. Now we're looking at Wild Haven, the Bay Area's top-rated glamping experience. Recharge, reconnect, and rediscover your love for nature. The trend I'm seeing is that your topmost tagline is really trying to get at people's emotions to make them feel the way you, that they would feel if they stayed at your property. So here we can see this glamping experience. We can see that it looks very comfortable. We can see it looks very luxurious, but it's also in the outdoors. And they've got this fun tagline, recharge, reconnect, and rediscover your love for nature. All right, this is very pathos. This is very emotion-driven. Life is too short to stay stuck in the city. City life is stressful and complicated, and a lack of balance can cause poor mental health. You deserve a break. So that's actually a little bit of logos as well. This is really kind of combining coming at someone's emotions and their logic at the same time. Because saying a lack of balance can cause poor mental health is a logical statement. You're trying to appeal, oh, that makes sense. And when someone reads that, they might think, oh, you know what? That's a good point. I do need to get back in the outdoors so I can improve my mental health. Recharge mind and body. Reconnect with loved ones. Rediscover your love for nature. All very emotion-driven. And the picture, of course, is a couple having a great time in a hammock. Very, very pathos. We know what it's like to be stuck in the city working the daily grind. Pathos. I'm ready to relax. What guests are saying, again, here's ethos. This is kind of the, the social proof. This is showing, look, we're not the only ones saying we're great. Our guests also say we're great. Therefore, we must be great. All right, and once again, we scroll to the bottom and we can see what the analytical people are looking for. They wanna see what are the amenities? What, uh, what's nearby? What is there to do in the area? What's the location? I want to know what, what else, what are some popular destinations? Uh, cool things to do, nearby activities. Yeah, this is all stuff that analytical people want to know. All right, last example. Let's take a look at Umpqua's last resort. Come as guests, return as friends. So obviously we're already very, very pathos oriented about the resort, hello and welcome. Uh, the region of the Oregon Cascade Mountains is commonly referred to as Oregon's Emerald Jewel Gateway to Crater Lake National Park. Spectacular marble river views, volcanic formations, thundering waters, 
and towering further just the beginning, the North Umpqua River is world class. So this, to me, seems like a combination of an appeal to authority and an appeal to emotion. By using big words like spectacular marble river views and thundering waters and towering firs, you're really kind of conveying a sense of awe and wonder in nature. But also you're saying it's world class and you're citing the the Oregon's Emerald Jewel Gateway as kind of an appeal to authority. Like, this is a great place to stay. These pictures really evoke, uh, again, that sense of awe and wonder at the majesty of nature, which is very pathos. One thing is for sure, we have the best cabins near Crater Lake, so if you want an adventurous outdoor vacation, book now. That one seems like a combination of ethos and kairos. Uh, the timeliness of and the, and the convenience of we're the best cabins near the lake, so you should book now. Uh, and then also just saying that they have the best cabins is, is an appeal to their own authority. And then more attractions around North Umpqua River. So this is a bit of logos. We're trying to cite some specific benefits of staying here. Uh, so you can scroll down, you can see all these different great places to go. But each of these specifically, again, is really just honing in on that awe and wonder. And it does look gorgeous. So this is certainly convincing me. And then again, we have the the uh, guest reviews for that for that great, great ethos. And then once again, you scroll to the bottom and we have what the analytical people are looking for. They're looking for specifically, can I pull my RV in here? So as you can see with all these websites, they each use pretty much every mode of persuasion at some point or other. Because if you just did one on your entire web page, then you would only be appealing to a small fraction of people. Whereas if you use every mode at some point throughout, then you will be expanding your reach and catching more people in your net of interest. So finally, there's social media marketing. For social media, the most effective mode of persuasion kind of depends on the social media platform itself. The thing about social media is that people don't usually follow pages who just use it to blatantly market themselves. So it's a tricky balance of trying to provide value to your followers as a way to subtly remind them about your awesome property. Here's an example of hospitality in social media. People use Instagram to see picture updates from their friends and family or to follow pages that post pictures they enjoy. On screen is an example of the Captain Swift Inn's Instagram account. Just recently, they showcased an artist they hosted they also posted a picture of a rainbow above their property, a plate of delicious looking food, a table setting, some great shots of the ocean and coast, some cocktails, a video about the making of sap, and some people skiing nearby. In other words, these are all posts about people and sensations, pathos at its finest. But when you have something to brag about, like being featured in a magazine or in a top 10 list or something, Instagram would be a great place to invite others to celebrate along with you. Different platforms have different feels to them, but this is the general rule across the board. People engage in social media to follow people or pages that provide some entertainment value to them. So that's typically what you'll go for. Unless, of course, you're doing paid advertising on social media platforms. In that case, you have more freedom to use whatever modes of persuasion work best for you. All right, and with that, we have come to the conclusion of the webinar. Thanks, everyone, so much for watching. If you'd like to view any of our past webinars, you can do so by going to resnexus.com and under the Education tab, clicking on Webinars. And there you can view any of our past webinars, and the timestamps are very helpful to help you navigate them. Uh, and you can also register for any upcoming webinars. Our next webinar will be about the new integration with the Little America travel agency. They're a traditional travel agency where they actually have people sit down with their clients to help them figure out where to stay. And specifically, these are English-speaking European travelers who are trying to find rustic places in the U.S. and Canada to stay. So be sure to register for that webinar when it becomes available. All right, and that being said, we are going to go ahead and move into the Q&A portion of the webinar, so please leave your questions in the field provided, and we will try and get those answered for you.